The poet stole meaning from the gods, hid it in words. That's why words intoxicate. But without meaning, the gods died. With meaning, men went mad. It's time for poets to take back their words. Disclaimer. This is not a bourgeois book. Associations that rise in the course of writing are not routinely suppressed because they fail to conform to middle-class expectations of what a book should be. The expectation that a book should be orderly, that whatever is out of order should be excluded. But everything I love is out of order. The world is out of order. If this book were not out of order, it would be a lie. I was a comparative literature major studying Greek and Latin literature. And what I learned was that in the beginning of poetry and philosophy, they were merged together. And the more modern distinction between poetry and philosophy, I always found somewhat artificial. I felt the two really completed each other, complemented each other. Language in poetry and logic and philosophy, they went together. When I was at Indiana University, I managed to get a minor in Biblical Hebrew. And I was appreciating the Bible as literature and not as sacred authority that I could pattern my life after. The book, The Gospel According to Jesus, was translated from the Greek. I, I pretended that the translator had never heard of Christianity because that's the way I thought it could be saved for world literature. This is all translation, and Jesus says, The farmer went out to scatter seed, and of the seed he scattered, some fell on the path where he walked, and the birds flew down and ate them. And of the seed he scattered, some fell on stony ground, where the soil was thin, and these were burned by the sun, because they had no roots to keep them moist. And of the seed he scattered, some fell where thistles grew, and these were choked for lack of breathing space. And of the seed he scattered, some fell on fertile ground and brought forth spikes of grain, one bearing a hundred kernels, another sixty, another thirty. But what does all this mean? Let these words take root and you will know. If the molten earth spun off from the molten sun, and the molten moon spun off from the molten earth, and if the moon has ceased its rotation, the same side always facing the earth, then isn't it likely that at this very moment the rotation of the earth is slowing down? perhaps decelerating at the rate at which a weed grows tall, and that someday, the day of zero rotation, when the same side of the earth always faces the sun, too hot for food to grow on the bright side, too cold for it to grow in the dark, that life will die out. Then won't people regret that they didn't major in philosophy in order to learn how to love the bitter truth and minor in pharmacy in order to learn as unvarying solar day approaches, as eternal galactic night comes on, how to sweeten the truth with powders. I read a lot of Eastern philosophy, Chang Su in particular. Chang Su was very important because I realized you can be witty and it's still sacred literature. And I documented it with Tao. He said, look at me. She gave him her eyes. 
He said, listen to me. She gave him her ears. He said, smell me. She gave him her nose. He said, kiss me. She gave him her mouth. He said, love me. She gave him her heart. He said, fuck me. She gave him her body. He said, adore me. She gave him her soul. He said, remember me. She gave him her mind. When he said goodbye, there were no tears. There was no sound. She smelled nothing. She tasted nothing. She felt nothing. She divined nothing. She remembered nothing. There was only stillness, which was not hers to give. I haven't had a career as either a poet or a philosopher, and that's good, because as a philosopher, whatever I've written, whatever I've committed to in the previous book, I must question and become my own critic in order to find out what the assumptions were that I fell for in order to be so convinced. So that is one advantage of remaining an amateur and obscure. The title of the book is Who Owns the Planet? Ownership begins with kids and their marbles playing marbles and winning marbles. So it's just one of the marbles that's up for sale. If friendly aliens arrive and expressing interest in purchasing the planet, ask who owns it, how shall we answer? Everyone equally? Or billionaires and millionaires? If everyone equally, we're communists. If billionaires and millionaires, we're capitalists. Who owns the planet? Their offer may be too good to decline. <laughs> Which I, I like the idea of what would happen after they bought the <laughs> This book grows out of Sir James Fraser's The Golden Bow, where he, you know, it's like a thousand pages of examples uh, from ancient literature from uh, all cultures of how the kings represented fortune. And it was a revelation to me when I finally realized that in the natural religion of the human species, it's not Christianity or Buddhism, or, that's all specialization. It's fortune worship. Because I was realizing I could tie it into space being infinite, I've always had it in for Einstein for curving space, which, you know, naturally leads to a sphere and finiteness. I don't blame them. You can sell a ball, but how can you sell something that's infinite? Fortune worship is how you deal with the infinite through randomness. And it's buried in our consciousness, and all it needs to do is come out so that we realize that we don't have to worship it. It's just a fact. And given our situation, which is impossible, another fact, we can do what's best for all of us. Capitalism is essentially a religious dogma, namely belief in fortune or luck as the ultimate arbiter of human affairs. While socialism represents the heresy that society exists as a refuge from the arbitrary decisions of fortune or luck. I like European philosophers because at least they give the impression that they don't know what's coming next. The logic wanders hither and yon, it becomes quite a maze. But that's to me of the living mind, you know, growing like a flower that doesn't know what its blossom is going to be. Anyway, Sermon on the Flats. I've been studying recently the history of the Republic from ancient to modern, and particularly focusing on American history since I also wanted to find out what I think of uh, being an American. I don't know yet. And I, I want to test that. I, I've always trended toward uh, egalitarianism. I, I'm testing, I'm still testing to see if the only way a republic can work ideally is for everyone to own it equally. It may not be that because you know, you have to accumulate capital in order to create an infrastructure. And that, as we know, takes money. And 
where does that money come from and blah, blah, blah. So anyways, I wanted to bring the two concepts together of egalitarianism and fortune worship because as a result of fortune worship, when it's unconscious, we create hierarchies, the winners and the losers. And clearly, there are always fewer winners than losers and interpreted politically, that means the loser base gets larger and larger while the winner base gets smaller and smaller, particularly if resources are becoming scarcer and scarcer, and we're going to run off a cliff if that's the case. If horses or lions had hands, that's a reference to Xenophanes, and it goes, but if cattle and horses or lions had hands, or were able to draw with their hands and do the work that men can do, horses would draw the forms of the gods like horses, and cattle like cattle, and they would make their bodies such as they each had themselves. So I figured that humans, all human ideas about religion and the gods, is a projection of human bodies and the culture that bodies produce. For all we know, a solitary cyborg, now extinct, might have designed and built out of biodegradable materials the male and female prototypes for a self-producing line of automated hardware which flourished and spread over the earth. But so what? We, their descendants, are still not machines, so long as we do not know who invented us or how we are supposed to work. We should thank our lucky stars that the secret of our origin and the blueprint of our nature is shrouded in darkness. Otherwise, the moment we know where we come from and what we are, ipso facto, we become a contrivance. My authority is logic, and I see where logic goes, I follow it, and when it, it contradicts, I know I've reached pay dirt. That is something that seems to be true, but that is logically impossible to conceive. We rely on logic, it keeps us sane. But if logic is logos, and logos is language, and speech wagging tongues, but one by one tongues droop, but not enough at any one time to start a tongue slide, then logic is the tongue we all stick out to sass death. <laughs>